Bloody Sunday, sometimes called the Bogside Massacre, was an incident on 30 January 1972 in the Bogside area of Derry, Northern Ireland. British soldiers shot 26 unarmed civilians during a protest march against internment. 14 people died. 13 were killed outright, while the death of another man four and a half months later was attributed to his injuries. Many of the victims were shot while fleeing from the soldiers and some were shot while trying to help the wounded. Two protesters were also injured when they were run down by army vehicles. The march had been organized by the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association and the Northern Resistance Movement. The soldiers involved were members of the 1st Battalion Parachute Regiment, also known as One Para. Two investigations have been held by the British government. The Widury Tribunal, held in the immediate aftermath of the incident, largely cleared the soldiers and British authorities of blame. It described the soldiers' shooting as bordering on the reckless, but accepted their claims that they shot at gunmen and bomb throwers. The report was widely criticised as a whitewash. The Saville Inquiry, chaired by Lord Saville of Newdigate, was established in 1998 to reinvestigate the incident. Following a 12-year inquiry, Savile's report was made public in 2010 and concluded that the killings were both unjustified and unjustifiable. It found that all of those shot were unarmed, that none were posing a serious threat, that no bombs were thrown, and that soldiers knowingly put forward false accounts to justify their firing. On the publication of the report, British Prime Minister David Cameron made a formal apology on behalf of the United Kingdom. Following this, police began a murder investigation into the killings. Bloody Sunday was one of the most significant events of the Troubles because a large number of civilians were killed by state forces. In full view of the public and the press, it was the highest number of people killed in a single shooting incident during the conflict. Bloody Sunday increased Catholic and Irish nationalist hostility towards the British Army and exacerbated the conflict. Support for the Provisional Irish Republican Army rose and there was a surge of recruitment into the organisation, especially locally. Background The city of Derry was perceived by many Catholics and Irish nationalists in Northern Ireland to be the epitome of what was described as 50 years of Unionist misrule. Despite having a nationalist majority, gerrymandering ensured elections to the city corporation always returned a Unionist majority. At the same time the city was perceived to be deprived of public investment, rail routes to the city were closed, motorways were not extended to it. A university was opened in the relatively small town of Coleraine rather than Darien. Above all, the city's housing stock was in an appalling state. The city therefore became a significant focus of the civil rights campaign led by organizations such as Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association in the late 1960s and it was in Derry that the so-called Battle of the Bogside, the event that more than any other pushed the Northern Ireland administration to ask for military support for civil policing, took place in August 1969. While many Catholics initially welcomed the British Army as a neutral force, in contrast to what was regarded as a sectarian police force, Relations between them soon deteriorated. In response to escalating levels of violence across Northern Ireland, internment without trial was introduced on 9 August 1971. There was disorder across Northern Ireland following the introduction of internment, with 21 people being killed in three days of rioting. In Belfast, soldiers of the Parachute Regiment shot dead 11 Catholic civilians in what became known as the Bala Murphy Massacre. On 10 August, bombardier Paul Challoner became the first soldier to be killed by the Provisional Ira in Derry, when he was shot by a sniper on the Cregan Estate. A further six soldiers had been killed in Derry by mid-December 1971. 
at least 1,332 rounds were fired at the British Army, who also faced 211 explosions and 180 nail bombs, and who fired 364 rounds in return. IRA activity also increased across Northern Ireland with 30 British soldiers being killed in the remaining months of 1971. In contrast to the 10 soldiers killed during the pre-internment period of the year, both the official IRA and provisional IRA had established no-go areas for the British Army and IUC in Derry through the use of barricades. By the end of 1971, 29 barricades were in place to prevent access to what was known as Free Derry. 16 of them impassable even to the British Army's one-ton armoured vehicles. I remember openly mounted roadblocks in front of the media, and daily clashes took place between nationalist youths and the British Army at a spot known as Agro Corner. Due to rioting and damage to shops caused by incendiary devices, an estimated total of £4 million worth of damage had been done to local businesses. On 18 January 1972, Brian Faulkner, Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, banned all parades and marches in Northern Ireland until the end of the year. On the 22nd of January 1972, a week before Bloody Sunday, an anti-internment march was held at McGilligan Strand, near Derry. The protesters marched to a new internment camp there, but were stopped by soldiers of the Parachute Regiment. When some protesters threw stones and tried to go around the barbed wire, paratroopers drove them back by firing rubber bullets at close range and making baton charges. The paratroopers badly beat a number of protesters and had to be physically restrained by their own officers. These allegations of brutality by paratroopers were reported widely on television and in the press. Some in the army also thought there had been undue violence by the paratroopers. NICRA intended, despite the ban, to hold another anti-internment march in Derry on Sunday 30 January. The authorities decided to allow it to proceed in the Catholic areas of the city, but to stop it from reaching Guildhall Square, as planned by the organisers. The authorities expected that this would lead to rioting. Major General Robert Ford, then commander of land forces in Northern Ireland, ordered that the 1st Battalion Parachute Regiment should travel to Derry to be used to arrest possible rioters. The arrest operation was codenamed Operation Forecast. The Saville Report criticized General Ford for choosing the Parachute Regiment for the operation, as it had their reputation for using excessive physical violence. The paratroopers arrived in Derry on the morning of the march and took up positions in the city. Brigadier Pat McClellan was the operational commander and issued orders from Ebrington Barracks. He gave orders to Lieutenant Colonel Derek Wilford, commander of One Para. He in turn gave orders to Major Ted Loden, who commanded the company who launched the arrest operation. Events of the day The protesters planned on marching from Bishop's Field, in the Cregan Housing Estate, to the Guildhall, in the city centre, where they would hold a rally. The march set off at about 2.45 p.m. There were 10 minus 15,000 people on the march, with many joining along its route. Lord Widgery, in his now discredited tribunal, said that there were only 3,000 to 5,000. The march made its way along William Street but, as it neared the city centre, its path was blocked by British Army barriers. The organisers redirected the march down Rossville Street, intending to hold the rally at Free Derry Corner instead. However, some broke off from the march and began throwing stones at soldiers manning the barriers. The soldiers fired rubber bullets, CS gas and water cannon to try and disperse the rioters. Such clashes between soldiers and youths were common, and observers reported that the rioting was not intense. Some of the crowd spotted paratroopers hiding in a derelict three-story building overlooking William Street, and began throwing stones at the windows. At about 3.55 p.m., these paratroopers opened fire. Civilians Damien Donaghy and John Johnston were shot and wounded while standing on waste ground opposite the building. These were the first shots fired. 
The soldiers claimed Donaghy was holding a black cylindrical object. At 4.07 p.m., the paratroopers were ordered to go through the barriers and arrest rioters. The paratroopers, on foot and in armored vehicles, chased people down Rossville Street and into the Bogside. Two people were knocked down by the vehicles. Brigadier McClellan had ordered that only one company of paratroopers be sent through the barriers, on foot, and that they should not chase people down Rossville Street. Colonel Wilford disobeyed this order, which meant there was no separation between rioters and peaceful marches. The paratroopers disembarked and began seizing people. There were many claims of paratroopers beating people, clubbing them with rifle butts, firing rubber bullets at them from close range, making threats to kill, and hurling abuse. The Saville report agreed that soldiers used excessive force when arresting people, as well as seriously assaulting them for no good reason while in their custody. One group of paratroopers took a position at a low wall about 80 yards in front of a rubble barricade that stretched across Rossville Street. There were people at the barricade and some were throwing stones at the soldiers, but none were near enough to hit them. The soldiers fired on the people at the barricade, killing six and wounding a seventh. A large group of people fled or were chased into the car park of Rossville Flats. This area was like a courtyard, surrounded on three sides by high-rise flats. The soldiers opened fire, killing one civilian and wounding six others. This fatality, Jackie Duddy, was running alongside a priest, Father Edward Daly, when he was shot in the back. Another group of people fled into the car park of Glen Fader Park, which was also a courtyard-like area surrounded by flats. Here, the soldiers shot at people across the car park, about 40 to 50 yards away. Two civilians were killed and at least four others wounded. The Saville report says it is probable that at least one soldier fired from the hip towards the crowd, without aiming. The soldiers went through the car park and out the other side. Some soldiers went out the southwest corner, where they shot dead two civilians. The other soldiers went out the southeast corner and shot four more civilians, killing two. About ten minutes had elapsed between the time soldiers drove into the bogside and the time the last of the civilians were shot. More than 100 rounds were fired by the soldiers, who were under the command of Major Ted Loden. Some of those shot were given first aid by civilian volunteers, either on the scene or after being carried into nearby homes. They were then driven to hospital, either in civilian cars or in ambulances. The first ambulances arrived at 4.28 p.m. The three boys killed at the rubble barricade were driven to hospital by the paratroopers. Witnesses said paratroopers lifted the bodies by the hands and feet and dumped them in the back of their APC, as if they were pieces of meat. The Saville report agreed that this is an accurate description of what happened. It says the paratroopers might well have felt themselves at risk but in our view this does not excuse them. The dead in all, 26 people were shot by the paratroopers, 13 died on the day and another died four months later. Most of them were killed in four main areas. The rubble barricade across Rossville Street, the courtyard car park of Rossville Flats, the courtyard car park of Glen Fader Park and the forecourt of Rossville Flats. All of the soldiers responsible insisted that they had shot it and hit gunmen or bomb throwers. The Saville report concluded that all of those shot were unarmed and that none were posing a serious threat. It also concluded that none of the soldiers fired in response to attacks or threatened attacks by gunmen or bomb throwers. The casualties are listed in the order in which they were killed. John, Jackie, Duddy, age 17, shot as he ran away from soldiers in the car park of Rossville Flats. The bullet struck him in the shoulder and entered his chest. Three witnesses said they saw a soldier take deliberate aim at the youth as he ran. He was the first fatality on Bloody Sunday. Like Saville, Widuri also concluded that Kelly was unarmed. His nephew is boxer John Duddy. Michael Kelly, age 17, shot in the stomach while standing at the rubble barricade on Rossville Street.
Both Saville and Widgery concluded that Kelly was unarmed. Hugh Gilmore, age 17, shot through his left elbow, the bullet then entering his chest as he ran away from the paratroopers near the rubble barricade on Rossville Street. Widgery acknowledged that a photograph taken seconds after Gilmore was hit corroborated witness reports that he was unarmed, and that tests for gunshot residue were negative. William Nash, age 19, shot in the chest at the rubble barricade. Witnesses stated Nash was unarmed. Three people were shot while apparently going to his aid, including his father Alexander Nash. John Young, age 17, shot in the face at the rubble barricade, apparently while crouching and going to the aid of William Nash. Two witnesses stated Young was unarmed. Michael McDade, age 20, shot in the face at the rubble barricade, apparently while crouching and going to the aid of William Nash. Kevin McElhinney, age 17, shot from behind, near the rubble barricade, while attempting to crawl to safety. Two witnesses stated McElhinney was unarmed. James, Jim, Ray, age 22, shot in the back while running away from soldiers in Glen Fader Park Courtyard. He was then shot again in the back as he lay mortally wounded on the ground. Witnesses, who were not called to the Widgery Tribunal, stated that Ray was calling out that he could not move his legs before he was shot the second time. William McKinney, age 26, shot in the back as he attempted to flee through Glen Fader Park Courtyard. Gerard McKinney, age 35, shot in the chest at Abbey Park. A soldier ran through an alleyway from Glen Fader Park and shot him from a few yards away. Witnesses said that when he saw the soldier, McKinney stopped and held up his arms, shouting, Don't shoot! Don't shoot! before being shot. The bullet apparently went through his body and struck Gerard Donaghy behind him. Gerard Donaghy, age 17, shot in the stomach at Abbey Park while standing behind Gerard McKinney. Both were apparently struck by the same bullet. Bystanders brought Donaghy to a nearby house where he was examined by a doctor. The doctor opened Donaghy's clothes to examine him, and his pockets were also searched for identification. Two bystanders then attempted to drive Donaghy to hospital, but the car was stopped at an army checkpoint. They were ordered to leave the car and a soldier drove it to a regimental aid post where an army medical officer pronounced Donaghy dead. Shortly after, soldiers found four nail bombs in his pockets. The civilians who searched him, the soldier who drove him to the army post, and the army medical officer all said that they did not see any bombs. This led to claims that soldiers planted the bombs on Donaghy to justify the killings. Donaghy was a member of Fianna Aaron, an IRA-linked Republican youth movement. Paddy Ward, a police informer who gave evidence at the Savile Inquiry, claimed he gave two nail bombs to Donaghy several hours before he was shot. The Savile report concluded that the bombs were probably in Donaghy's pockets when he was shot. However, it concluded that he was not about to throw a bomb when he was shot, and that he was not shot because he had bombs. He was shot while trying to escape from the soldiers. Patrick Doherty, aged 31, shot from behind while attempting to crawl to safety in the forecourt of Rossville Flats. He was shot by soldiers who came out of Glen Fader Park. Doherty was photographed moments before and after he died by French journalist Giles Bress. Despite testimony from Soldier F that he had shot a man holding a pistol, Widgery acknowledged that the photographs show Doherty was unarmed, and that forensic tests on his hands for gunshot residue proved negative. Bernard Barney McGuigan, age 41, shot in the head when he walked out from cover to help Patrick Doherty. He had been waving a white handkerchief to indicate his peaceful intentions. John Johnston, age 59, shot in the leg and left shoulder on William Street 15 minutes before the rest of the shooting started. Johnston was not on the march but on his way to visit a friend in Glen Fader Park. He died on 16 June 1972. His death has been attributed to the injuries he received on the day.
He was the only one not to die immediately or soon after being shot.